So, um, the topic for today was uh, perk screw placement, but I figured since last week had some technical issues, um, I had to add uh, uh, lateral. Uh, so we'll do both today. I'll try to squeeze that in the 30 plus minutes that we have. Um, so starting off, uh, obviously MIS surgery has been um, a, a little more in vogue and taking over more and more of the degen aspects of uh, spinal surgery and to some degree deformity uh, surgery. Um, the primary goal is not necessarily cosmesis, it's functional anatomy preservation. And as you can see in the picture on the right, uh, a large part of that's trying to preserve the multifidi. So the, the whole, ra a lot of the rationale for perk screw fixation is protecting the primary stabilizers of the vertebral segments, which are the multifidi, and using that Wilty style approach to, to move lateral to them uh, down to the starting point for the, the percutaneous screws. Um, there are other techniques for putting fixation in uh, beyond transpedicular screws. Uh, cortical screws is an example. Not totally clear yet to us whether that is protective of the multifidi. Uh, part of the rationale for for me and uh, many of us not using that technique is substantially. Um, you do have to strip that musculature off the spinous processes and uh, ultimately you may be doing some damage to both the muscles directly and uh, the exposure can violate some of the innervation to it. So having said that, there's there it's just not well studied at this point, but something to think about. Uh, the old uh, paradigm of, of maximum exposures you see in the picture carried with it uh, infection risk that was more substantial from void uh, creation. And uh, there have been studies done even on the muscle function postoperatively with uh, open versus MIS representing a, a retention of functional uh, capacity in the muscle with it. Having said all that, there's some technical challenges to doing MIS placement of screws. Um, you could use imaging uh, or navigation or, or even robotics now, uh, but the bottom line is you can't visually assess or use landmarks to place the screws. You're generally not feeling the walls of the screw site, although I, I suspect in skinnier people, you might be able to accomplish that but you have to use some other means of, of visualizing internally. Uh, so use a radio, at least a table. Um, uh, in the old days, uh, people used regular tables and chest rolls, uh, we used Wilson frames, but obviously uh, with a greater acknowledgement of alignment, uh, Jackson tables with posts and optimization of lumbar lordosis is uh, encouraged. And obviously you wanna do it in cases where you can see reasonably well. So these are the, the open landmarks for entry that you would utilize. You can see the, the red dots here um, uh, at the transverse process, uh, pedicle, uh, I'm sorry, uh, facet and pars intersection is sort of the starting point that you typically utilize in an open technique. And really it's the same starting point in general, maybe slightly lateral in the percutaneous technique, you just can't see those things. Um, however, uh, you have imaging as you see here, and uh, we'll talk about using your finger for eyes inside to some degree as well. So the room setup, as you can see, is something like this. Uh, you have the uh, fluoroscopy unit typically starting in the AP position, and you change the Ferguson or Kant uh, appropriately to optimize the uh, profile view of each segment of the spine. Uh, in consideration, you want to change rainbow as you need to as well. You wanna have a picture like this in which the pedicles on either side are evenly bisected uh, by the, um, the spinous process. So the interpedicular distance should be bisected at each level and you wanna have an on foss view of the end plates of each uh, of the cephalad and caudad ends of the vertebra. 
Now that's easier said than done. Sometimes uh, there are issues with um, sclerosis of a pedicle. Pedicles can be very small. Spinous processes can be abnormal as well. Beware and uh, scrutinize your preoperative imaging for spinous processes that do not come off of the vertebra in an in a symmetric manner. Uh, once in a while, you'll have spinous processes, particularly in the lower lumbar spine, that deviate five to 15 degrees off the midline, um, or they come off the back of the vertebra in an angular way. And so if you use that spinous process in this fashion, you will find yourself five to 15 degrees off plane. So it's a combination of all these features, including looking at the pedicles to make sure they look or appear symmetric in the way they approximate the edge of the vertebra. An example down here would be, uh, below that would be this pedicle uh, does look farther lateral than the, the contralateral pedicle. So use all these features to guide you and, and that includes the preoperative imaging assessment. So that doesn't get you in trouble. And that'll be important for you when you do laterals as well. Uh, you don't necessarily have to start with this view, but when, you, when you're when you first starting to use this technique, if you haven't done it before, it's not a bad idea to get a lateral so that you know that uh, you've got a crisp lateral and you know your Florotech uh, has the right, right uh, lateral position. They may have to wag their machine a little bit. In general, we will start with the AP and we will wait until we get our jam sheeties uh, started before we go to lateral. And then once you do, you wanna see these pedicles superimposed uh, and then you want to see on FOS views of the end plates against cephalan and caudate. If you have a trapezoidal vertebra, you may not see that uh, on FOS view quite as readily, at least on one end or the other, uh, but you should shoot for that with normal vertebral morphology. When you do PERC, you want to plan your incisions, and you, get, you generally start with the AP view, as I said, and when you do uh, choose the type of incision. It can be one of the following. And, and on the right picture, you can see on the left side, two vertical incisions that are centered over the starting point for the pedicle. Uh, on the right side, there's a singular incision. Uh, it's really a dealer's choice on how you do this. Many people like the left technique. I like the right technique. Um, I find it's a bit more cosmetic and I can use my finger more reliably to palpate which reduces my floral load. If you palpate, you can get a very good starting position without the need of any shots at all. And you tend to be closer to the point at which you're gonna enter anyway. Uh, those, those sorts of techniques, when you have uh, a fair bit of fluoroscopy in your life, if they reduce it five, 10% over a lifetime, that makes a big difference. So um, I like I said, I like this Wiltsy type, uh, paramedian approach. Uh, it tends to create an incision that's probably two thirds of the total length that you need with the individual incisions because you can share space within that incision. Um, but uh, both are reasonable. Let me close this down. So when you are marking your incision, you can use different tools. Uh, you see on the on the left side, sort of the plastic surgeon's technique. And the midline is an old scar. And you can see these, these uh, markings just to get guidance on uh, uh, angular relationship of the C arm and um, the space, uh, the actual starting points for the screws. These points will all vary depending on the depth of the patient. And so you, you have to plan um, that angular trajectory from skin incision down to starting point relative to the depth that you anticipate working. Uh, that's not always something easily assessed by uh, looking at the skin or even palpating. You have to look at the pre-op MRI and get a sense of distance. So it, it ends up being a, a slight game of trigonometry, but you also have some flexibility to move the skin a little bit. And, and once you go through the skin, you will assess the soft tissues deeper to that to get another uh, guide on exactly where to, where to incise the deeper muscle fascia and uh, how angular you need to be. Um, the more critical feature of the incisions is, is how to place them cephalocaudad relative to the pedicles. 
And for that, um, the easiest aiming point is just lateral to the disc space. Uh, so if you if you find, and you could draw a single point. So if you could see my, um, my pointer here, uh, let's say this was the pedicle of one and this is the pedicle of the other. The disc space is going to be somewhere in between. Generally, you could take a, a point, uh, a marking point, about two centimeters to three centimeters uh, lateral to midline, which will generally be about a centimeter lateral to your pedicle starting point, uh, maybe two if it's a very uh, uh, large patient, and mark it right about there. Once you've marked that point, uh, which shouldn't take much fluoro use. Then you can draw a line vertical, a centimeter above, centimeter below, and that should be adequate and reliable to get to your, your starting points. So you could do it this way. Uh, this gets a little obnoxious from my perspective. Um, as Cody just learned, I'll just use a uh, shallow gelpie and lay it on the patient in an open position right about where I think the lateral aspect of the disc spaces are and then mark both points. It's a, it's a very quick and easy way to do it rather than sticking uh, K wires on and drawing a number of lines like this, it works pretty well. So in the end, this left-sided view is what, what I would shoot for. You're gonna have an incision somewhere around there in a skinny patient slightly lateral to that in a larger patient to favor your your longer throw from incision down to starting point. Um, you can see here on the right side, what that might look like. Um, so what you see is them drawing out the pedicles on either side and then the starting point for those, if you were gonna do two separate incisions, in my hands, I would do an incision that would go from here to here, from basically the bottom of the top line to the top of the bottom line, and then use that a uh, single incision to get to both points. The incision length tends to be about the top of the bottom pedicle to the bottom of the top pedicle, and that works fairly well. Remember, you have some mobility of the soft tissues to make that work. The higher you go in the lumbar spine and the more neutral the levels are versus lordotic, the longer the incision needs to be, mainly because you're, you end up having longer rods and a more parallel trajectory. So whereas you might get away with a two centimeter incision down at L5S1, at L12, you might need three centimeters just to accommodate the longer um, uh, distance between pedicles and the lack of uh, convergence of the towers makes a difference in what you need. So, in terms of your starting point on the image, uh, obviously this isn't a perfect AP, but you're the, the, the point of this shot was to go over where you want to start your jam sheety. You can see uh, the lateral starting point tends to be at the, the three o'clock position or the nine o'clock position if you're looking at the opposite side. And it's just at the cortical border. Now, you'll have very enlarged facets that sometimes cause you to start farther lateral. That's okay. Just be aware with your finger palpating that that may be the case. And if you can't find a different starting point uh, than that, or you tend to, you, you otherwise go medial to this cortical starting point, then you're probably too medial. Um, so start a little lateral, get your jam sheet started. And in, in those situations where you're uncertain, once you get started and you go in a centimeter, so you can always go to a pedicle view, which is a, is a rainbow overview that will look straight down the pedicle. So it can, it can be from 10 to 25 degrees of rainbow, and you'll get a nice crisp view right down the chute of the pedicle. So you can see if you're too medial, too lateral. Um, and the other, the other way reason to use that view is it will often give you a crisp view of the facet joint. So you know you're not violating the facet joint. In this case, you can actually see the facet joint here. You obviously don't want to be in that or close to violating it with your jam sheet because your screw will violate it then. And uh, that's a potential point of uh, adjacent segment disease uh, or deterioration and uh, post-operative pain, which you will see if you scrutinize enough of these patients uh, in clinic that either come from your practice or others and say, I have this horrible pain. Don't, don't overlook the possibility of a facet being violated by those cephalad screws. Once you get started in the pedicle, 
you want to take the jam sheety down typically between 25 degrees and maybe 30 degrees. Uh, and at that point, your medial tip, I'm sorry, your tip of the jam sheety should be approximated in the medial wall or at the medial wall of the pedicle. So um, you have to look at your jam sheeties and get a sense for what they uh, what they have in terms of gauging. There are some jam sheety needles that will give you a sense of depth uh, very readily. Others, um, as we had uh, a decade or more ago, did not have that grading and we would just mark it. So we'd, put, we'd dock on the skin and you can use a marking pen and mark 25 or 30 millimeters above the skin on the jam sheety and then take it into that point. So fit, just figure out the way in which you wanna gauge it. But once you get started, go in 25, 30 millimeters uh, to that medial wall. And then you could do that on both sides to save fluoros and, and be more efficient with the fluoroscopy. Then you can flip to your lateral. Your lateral should then show that you're just entering or past the posterior wall of the vertebral body at that 25, 30 millimeter depth. So you should have this marriage between tip of the jam sheety at the medial wall and the AP and on the lateral, just entering the vertebral body. If your jam sheety tip is all the way here, it's, it's buried in the body and you've just gotten to the medial wall or you're halfway uh, between the lateral and medial wall and the AP of the pedicle, you have to question whether you're too, too lateral. You can some, sometimes be in the wrong position. So it needs to be a marriage of those two positions on the AP and lateral. So you can see here uh, that concept of, uh, of one of the old uh, Medtronic jam sheeties that didn't have gauging. And here's the skin level and marking 30 millimeters above or 25 millimeters above. So you know when that, that mark got to the skin, you're, you're buried to that uh, point. There you go. Um, the odd foss uh, view, as I said, or pedicle view, as we call it in the OR sometimes, is looking straight down the chute of the pedicle. Uh, it's a, a nice way to be sure that you're really centered uh, and you have not violated the pedicle, nor are you too lateral. Here's a look at the lateral view, again, with the, the uh, guide wires in pos uh, position. And uh, then you can, you can uh, certainly uh, neurostimulate the tap if you wish. Uh, if you do that, you need to have a sheath for it. Um, it's not gonna work to stimulate the metal if it's, uh, if it's unprotected. And you can see here, placing the, uh, placing the screws. Uh, one, of the, one of the cautionaries of this is, uh, as you put the, the guide wires in, you wanna generally just try to push them in with your hand. Sometimes the bone's soft enough in the trabecular fashion or in the trabecular area that you can just push it in. Uh, if you have to mallet it in with a, a needle driver, uh, make sure that you're conscientious about the depth you put it in. Try not to penetrate the anterior cortex. If you do, it's not the end of the world. Just draw it back and you'll have to take more shots in the lateral as you're putting the screw in to make sure that you're not pushing the wire through, which can injure either bowel or uh, vessels, but it, it works best uh, to just avoid that transgression in the first place. So as you're putting the screws in, remember you want to um, uh, guide the, uh, uh, try to be collinear with your guide wire. Uh, one of the other techniques too, let's say you have um, a guide wire, um, say this bottom one at L, L4 here, that you don't like the trajectory of. One of the things you can do to alter the trajectory of your screw is as you tap, you can put your tap in um, and, and drive your tap to the um, back of the vertebral body. Pull your wire back to the tip of the, of the, um, of the uh, tap and then redirect your tap more in a more cephalad fashion. Sorry, I keep losing my arrow. More cephalad fashion to parallel your end plate. And then once you're in that position, you can put your wire back out through the, the end of the uh, tap and then draw the tap back. That will reposition your wire and therefore reposition your, your screw in a, in a trajectory that you favor over where your wire originally went. 
Um, another caution when you're putting the screws in the screws wires. The Go ahead. Did you have a question? Question? No. Uh, when you're putting the the screws in, be careful as you're trying to put the screw through the skin and soft tissues. It, it, it you need to sort of wiggle through. Um, bend in the wind like a reed, as they say. If you just jam the screw through the soft tissue and you get hung up at all, or the wire gets bound, then you can force the wire through the front of the vertebral body, particularly with softer or osteopenic bones. So kind of wiggle through, be uh, almost like a two finger hold on the whole apparatus and watch your wire to make sure it's not advancing with you. Once the screw's on the side of the, uh, the facet wall and in the starting position, um, you can start turning it and you can also watch the wire, make sure it's not turning with the screw. It's not advancing with the screw, particularly the first few turns. If it looks like it's doing so, you can hold the back of the wire with a needle driver to disengage the two from friction or binding uh, and take another uh, couple shots on the way to make sure that you've uncoupled them and that the screw's advancing without pushing the wire. Once you have the screws in and be careful not to overdrive the screws, especially when you're starting this, remember like an open or as, as you have an open where you can see it, um, you, you don't get that, um, that visual perception. You have to rely entirely on fill or fluoroscopy. So be careful at first, don't overdrive and fracture the facet, which drops your, um, your screw bone interface and, and pull out strength up to 40 or 50% uh, and, and use, use kind of small incremental turns so you get the sense of, of uh, buildup in resistance as you get closer to that final um, housing get, of, of the tulip approximating the, the lateral bone. And then you close. Uh, closure is easier with the single incision as I showed you than the two incisions. Um, part of the reason I like it, you can actually close the fascia um, and, and visualize it. It's hard to see much through the single incisions. And there's a look at uh, an old school uh, Medtronic. And there's obviously navigation now, which makes all of that uh, fluoroscopy discussion different. Uh, you're going to use localizers, and now they're even um, sharp screws that are self starting, as you see here. So Lots of, uh, lots of options on how you put in MIS screws now, but having a, a really good awareness of, of being MIS capable through fluoroscopy is a wonderful tool to have in your bag if anything um, is uh, disrupted in your, in your service line with O-Arm or any of these navigation robot, robotics platforms. It's good to have this tool in your bag. You can do it almost anywhere. And as I said, if you, if you do that single incision and you palpate, honestly, you can get a uh, pretty fast style with that and be right on target, even without fluoroscopy and your starting point, the vast majority of the time. Now, I don't advocate that um, from an accuracy perspective, you're better to combine them. But if you're in a pinch, um, you could theoretically do that and, and, uh, and then palpate it and be pretty close to what you get. And, in uh, open technique, as long as you can, you can go back in with a ball tip probe. Any questions about perk screws, perk technique? Hey Bob, just a quick comment on uh, the wire issue with navigation. You know, yeah. one of the things that you, you very appropriately bring up is the need to check your wire position on fluoro as you're driving your screw because it'll bind. And with the nat traditional navigation now, and if it's over a wire, the robot in particular, you, you can't, unless you're doing fluoroscopy, you can't tell where the wire is. You don't, you can't navigate the wire. So that's a real key nuance to navigation. If you're doing it and you're using a wire-based system, keep in mind, you cannot navigate the tip of the wire. Right, good point. I think most of them have moved away from that. Just use dr a drill um, yeah. technique and then use the, use the, uh, apparatus to get the screw in the starting position without a guide wire, but yeah, very good. Yeah, there, there was or a you point can where create we a virtual, huh? A virtual, you can create a virtual K wire as well, right. and kind of let that find the hole for you. 